Hello everyone, this is Experiment Design in Computer Science, Week 7, Sample Sizes, Part 2, Sample Sizes. Let's talk about sample sizes. So we're going to talk about sample size calculation. Um, before we begin, I guess a lot of people have heard of the magic number 30. We repeat 30, each experiment 30 times. So some people think, okay, uh, can I just use 30 repetitions? Um, do I really need to calculate sample sizes? Um, is it okay to use 30? Is it a good value? Well, why so many people use, oh, we repeat, it, we repeat the experiment 30 times? Why is it common? Okay, so the 30, the number 30 comes from the central limit theorem. Okay, so the cent remember that we talked about central limit theorem on lecture three, I believe. And we talked that the central limit theorem states that the distribution of the sample mean uh, estimator becomes closer to normal as the sample size n increases. Okay, now there is a result, and you can look at that. There is a paper that d d d describes a result that when n is bigger than 30, the CLT holds, which means that the sample means follow a normal distribution for most of the relevant cases except for very extreme cases of non-normality. Now, this is an important result because many test statistics require the assumption of normality. So it was like, okay, if you use 30, you are guaranteed for most cases that to have like a sample that kind of follows normal. However, remember that the assumption of normality is just one of the many things that you have to take into consideration in your uh, experiment. It's not everything. It's important, but it's not everything. For example, in the last um, video, we talked about the power of the experiment and the confidence of the experiment. And we talked about the cost of the experiment. This value of the 30 and the CLT, they don't say anything about the power. They don't say anything about the confidence. They don't say anything about the cost. So when you choose 30, um, there is nothing special about it. it. It doesn't really give you any particular power or any particular uh, confidence. So it's, it, it doesn't really help a lot. Okay, So any equal to 30, using 30 repetition does not guarantee anything about the power or confidence of your experiment. So you still need to perform power calculations. And when you perform those power calculations, you may even realize that actually you need much less than 30 repetitions. You can get some, uh, for some kinds of experiment, you can get some very statistically robust results with a much smaller number of samples. Or sometimes you need a much bigger number of samples. So it really depends on your experiment. Also remember that uh, your test might have other assumptions. For example, the assumptions that the variances are similar, the very important assumptions that the um, uh, observations are independent, so um, 30 can be a good starting point to think about sample sizes, but it does not really answer the many questions that you have to answer when you're doing uh, your experiment design. So how do we do the sample size calculation? Well, actually, we can use the same power test that we talked about in the last video to do sample size calculation. So let's go back to the example experiment that we had on the last video. We have standard deviation one, we have our target significance level to be 0 0.01, which means 99% confidence. Uh, and we're using a one sample test with a one-sided, uh, no hypothesis, uh, alternate hypothesis. And let's say that our target power now is 0 0.85 and our delta is 0 0.5. So we want to know how many samples we need for ha to have a power of 85, so a beta of 0 0.15, and a delta of 0 0.5. So we want to detect a difference of at least 0 0.5 with 85% power and 99% confidence. So when we calculate the power of the theta, where the, when we, we do the power calculation, the calculation tells us that our n should be at least 47.98, which means we need 48 samples for this experiment. If 48 samples is too much, then we can recalculate this with a lower power 
or a lower significance level or a higher delta and that will and then we can change this calculation change this design until we have an experiment that will satisfy us both in terms of cost and also in terms of the capacity to answer our scientific question notice that this all this calculation is before we collect data okay this is in the design stage of the experiment well that was for one mean what about for two means okay so for two means, uh, usually when we do experiment, we compare two things. We have two samples and we want to compare the means of those two samples. Uh, let's imagine a situation where our desired significance is 0 0.5. So we have now 95% significance and the desired power is one minus beta is 0 0.8. So our beta is 0 0.2 or power is 0 0.8. And now our relevant effect size here is 15. We want to see a difference of at least 15. 15 what? Depends on the experiment. It can be 15 centimeters, 15 seconds, 15. Now, we don't know the variances. So we have the variance of sample one and the variance of sample two, and we don't know. So what do we do? Okay, so we can use this specification to obtain the sample sizes. Now, the calculation for the sample sizes for 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 the, for two samples there are two things that we have to think about are the sample sizes the same or are the sample sizes different for two difference and that's something that we don't usually think about like we think oh we are comparing two samples they should have the same sample size that's not really true remember why are, are why do we have a sample why are we taking multiple observations we are taking multiple observations to reduce the effect of the noise of the randomness in the observations from this we can imagine that if the two samples have different variances we can we could we could have a bigger sample on this uh, a bigger sample size for the sample with higher variance and we can have a smaller sample size for the sample with smaller variance okay so if the variances are approximately equal then we're gonna have similar sample sizes for both and we calculate it like this so we're doing a t-test for two samples and this n will be approximately equal to this formula and you can see that this formula depends on alpha it depends on beta it depends on the difference as well and you can also see something interesting that this formula is an iterative formula because we have n on both sides and it's very hard to put them together i'm not going to go into the details of how to calculate this but it's interesting to notice what is the de what depends on the sample size how the different parts of our experiment design are connected together okay now in fact, the calculation will be done using the same formulas as before, but by knowing what is the formula, we can have a better understanding, a better appreciation of what is being calculated and what are the consequences. So if we assume that the sample sizes are the same uh, and the variance is the same, we can do something like this. So we do the sample size calculation is, again, our priority test. Our delta is 15, as we described. And here, note that we're doing saying that the standard deviation is 15. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Uh, we have the significance level, the power to sample, and one-sided. And it will give us this result. Note here that when we have two sample, this n is the size of each sample. Okay? So we need 13, uh, 14, 14 observations for sample 1 and 14 observations for sample 2 for a total of 28 observations. Now, how did we get that variance of 15? Okay, uh, we have this problem. So we need an estimate of the variance to calculate the sample size, but we don't always have that. Okay, uh, if we want to estimate the variance from the data, we need to have some observations. So that's kind of a chicken and an egg problem, right? We need variance to calculate the sample size, but we need some observations to calculate the variance. So what do we do? Well, there are a few solutions. It, of course, depends on your experiment. One solution is to use knowledge from the process or historical data to have an initial estimate of the variance. 
what does this mean? This means that we can look, for example, for experiments on the same, same process in the past and see if they have calculations of variance. And we can use those calculations as an initial estimate. If we're doing an industrial experiment, maybe there is already a process that analyze machines that we are doing an experiment that can tell us the variance. So we can use past knowledge and we must be explicit about what past knowledge we are using to estimate the variance. Another solution is to use an standardized MREs. What is a standardized MREs? You remember that in lecture three, we described that we can say, okay, we are going to use a um, minimal, um, minimal effect that is the minimal effect divided by the variance. If we divided the minimal effect by the variance, we have a value that assumes that the variance is one. So we are doing the power calculation describing delta as a number of variance. So in this case, the number of area, the, the, the exact value of the variance does not matter so much. So we can say that the variance is one and our delta here will not be the absolute difference, but the relative difference. So we can say, oh, I want our delta to be at least two times the variance. So I say that the variance is one, the delta is two, and that will give me the uh, power calculation to an effective difference of two times the variance. Of course, when you report, you have to actually calculate that variance and you have to then explain that uh, the minimum effect of two times the variance or three times the variance is actually effective. Okay. A third option is to actually perform a pilot study and collect samples to estimate the variance. And then we ask ourselves what should be the sample size of the pilot study and you can search for many suggestions uh, about the sample size. It usually does not be, need to be super big. Just notice that this is an, a different experiment. So you have to do an initial experiment to learn the variance of a process and learning the variance of a process, you do another experiment to actually investigate uh, the effect that you want to understand. Each approach has advantages and drawbacks. Okay, I'm not going to go too deep into, the, into those. Okay, let's go to other cases. Let's say that we have a pair design. So we mentioned in the lecture about pair design that pair design has a higher power than an unpaired design. And we can see this when we calculate uh, the sample size for pair design. So we can use a pair design to reduce the sample size that we need for our experiment. Okay, pair designs can require a smaller sample size for equivalent power. When, we, when is that? If the variation between the units is high, so if the difference between, the pair, between each pair is high, but the variance inside the pair is small, then the, uh, the, the pair design will reduce the need of um, uh, the sample size. So for, let's, for example, let's say that the variation in a level, so for instance, the variation for each problem, remember that we use pair, pair design to use an algorithm on different power instance, on a different problem instance. So let's say that for each problem instance, the variation is sigma epsilon. But uh, the variance for the entire process across all the problems is sigma u. So um, if we have an n that is big enough, the difference between the n unpaired and the n paired will be appro approximately a square root of two sigma u over sigma epsilon. So if you know sigma u and sigma epsilon, you can calculate the the number of the necessary number of um, observations using the power calculation for the unpaired, and then you can use a formula like this to know uh, the number of observations that you need for paired. This is what explains that when you have a pair design, you can use very few observations to have a very strong power. What about ANOVA? Last lecture, we talked about ANOVA. That is the test that we can use for multiple comparisons. Okay. Um, now, ANOVA, there are two different sample sizes that we are interested. 
there is the ANOVA test, that is when we compare everyone to see if one, of, one or more of the samples is different from the grand mean. And there is the post hoc test, when you do the comparisons after the ANOVA, the one versus all or the all versus all. So how do you compare? Let's talk now. The post hoc analysis can be done using the power uh, the power calculations that we talked before. Remember that in ANOVA, the post hoc analysis is a set of paired comparisons. And for these paired comparisons, you have the alpha discount, the, the adjustment of alpha for the number of pairs. So you use the adjusted alpha on the power calculation, okay, to calculate the sample size. Now, the, for the initial ANOVA, um, we have to do this equality of uh, f, the f distribution on 1 minus alpha equal to f distribution of beta. Okay? Um, this calculation depends on if we are thinking about a symmetric difference from the mean. So we have a grand mean and we have some levels under the grand mean and some levels above the grand mean. Or if we have one level that is above the grand mean and all the other levels below the grand mean. Depending on what kind of bias we are expecting from the experiment, we do the calculation slightly different. Let's see both cases, okay? So we have A4, so this is the number of levels. We have four levels for our ANOVA, like in the, like in the example that we gave on the last, uh, on the last video, we on the last le week. And then we have a confidence of 0 0.05, and we have our estimated as variance of seven. And let's say that we want to detect if any two means have a difference of at least delta equal to of 12 with power 0 0.8. So if we consider the first case where two of the levels are below the mean and two of the levels are above the mean, okay? Then, uh, sorry, one of the levels below the mean, one of the levels above the mean, and the others are around the mean, then we can calculate it like this. So we have the parameters that we talked before, and we calculate this tau uh, as that vector, uh, minus delta, plus delta, and two zeros. And we do the power ANOVA test, and the power ANOVA test will tell us that we need at least eight um, at least nine samples for each of the each at least nine observations for each of the sample that we are studying. Okay. On the other hand, if we have one level that is biased and all the other levels are about the same, then we calculate the tau again to say what is our estimate, what we believe that's going to happen in the experiment, and that will give us the uh, power of the ANOVA. We need six. Uh, uh, six observations for each sample. Note that these calculations are for the first stage of the ANOVA. Okay? If we need to do a post hoc analysis, then we need to calculate also the sample size for the multiple comparisons. Because of this, what happens in fact in ANOVA is that we already imagined that we might need to do the post hoc analysis, so we do the sample size calculation on the number of paired comparisons that we need to do. Okay. Now, this concludes an uh, overview of the sample size calculation for the different kinds of hypothesis tests that we studied in this course. So we studied um, ANOVA, and we studied sim uh, single sample, and we studied multiple sample. I did not mention uh, power size calculation for um, the known for the uh, non parametric uh, tests. So I encourage you to take a look at those. Okay. Um, now. The formulas that I talked before are just scratching the surface. There are many more ways to calculate uh, power and sample sizes. So I really recommend that you think about what is the kind of test that you need for your experiment and study how do you calculate the sample size for that. Also, we only talked about the case where all the samples are the same, but I mentioned that it's possible to use samples of different sizes 
so that you reduce the total number of preservations that you need. There is one paper that is very good about that, that is a paper about the discussion of sample sizes for the comparison of algorithms. Uh, so if you want to compare different algorithms and you want to calculate the same per si paper size, I recommend this paper by Felipe. Uh, it's talk about uh, how you estimate sample sizes for comparison between algorithms. Okay, so this is a high recommended length. Other, so this is the paper that I, uh, I mentioned. Also, Sample Size Calculations is a book that you can have a lot of information about many, many different tests. And this paper here talks also a little bit more about uh, how do you uh, about how do you calculate uh, ideas behind the calculation of sample size? So make sure to take list at least take a look on the recommended reads. Okay, uh, that finishes the slide the, the lecture for today. Thank you everyone. Uh, remind reminding that next week we will do a case study, and this case study will will read a few papers on computer sciences that uh, talk, that do experiments, and we will discuss um, how the experiment design analysis and reporting is done on these papers. So you can see the strengths and weakness in an statistical analysis on real papers. So see you there. Bye-bye.